Donna? Hi, how are you? Hi, Donna, I'm good. <clears throat> I was just giving a brief background on you. Um, and um, I was just letting them know that you know, you've got 20 years experience conducting qualitative and quantitative research in the areas of criminology and health. Um, since 2009, you've applied scientific research background to your interest in the survival of consciousness or life after death. Um, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just to broaden that out for our guests that are listening, um, you founded Metaphys Metaphysics Research in 2009 to study mental and physical mediumship and other phenomena to increase awareness about the true nature of reality. And your primary intent is to help people understand how they can use spiritual energy to enhance the quality of their lives. Um, which, you know, later on in their interview, I would like to go to you telling us more about your research and how Medium 7, your book, came to be and the case studies and all of that. Sure, happy to do that. Okay. Well, um, let's see. First off, in my interest, I would like to know what what made this transition happen? What brought you from the research aspect over to metaphysical research and really pursuing this to the point of doing case studies and publishing a book and Okay, well, I guess that's a good question. A good place to start is all at the beginning, and I, I would just say that um, although I'm not a medium myself, I, in the early years, probably starting at the age of 10, had my own spiritual experiences. So I wouldn't, I, I almost hesitate to say that, you know, everything just started um, sort of, let's say, 10 years ago, because I'd almost say throughout my whole life I was having spiritual experiences, not, not a medium who would do this professionally, but... So had sort of that predisposition to sort of wondering what really is the nature of reality, but specifically an incident that happened to me probably um, more into my early university years, probably just in my early 20s. Um, I was visiting a, what I thought to be a psychic, because to me at that time I didn't really make a distinguish between psychics and mediums, and it was really only for fun. I was going with a friend, and this medium started telling me um, I, I mean, my objective was really just to go there to find out maybe information about my future, you know, what information could they just generally tell me about career and love life, that kind of thing. Very yeah, innocent. Yeah, just for, just for fun, just to see what will come about of it. Pardon me? Just to see what would come out of it, really? Exactly. Just, just like it was hearted. all based on curiosity, exactly. And um, what had happened is she started to tell me that my grandmother was there and what specifically threw me was she stated my grandmother's name, and my grandmother's name is extremely um, specific. It's Beryl, B-E-R-Y-L, and she sort of laughed because she said, oh, I must be getting this wrong, because whose name would be Beryl, right, like a rolling barrel? And I explained right. that that's an English name, B-E-R-Y-L. What's interesting about that, Everly, is that um, at that time, there was no Internet, and, and not even like my grandmother would have had her name on the internet, but there there really wasn't anything, and I think that was for me like the first Ancestry. time. dot com, where you know she could have figured that out that way. Exactly, there there was no way. There's there was no information. In fact, the, the key part about that reading was she never had any information about me because it wasn't expected. I didn't make the appointment. I was with a friend, and she said, "Oh, do you want a reading as well?" So I thought, okay. So I think that was for me the first time that I realized that. There's something more to this. Perhaps there is sort of life after death. And then I think that for me was just the sort of the start of that kind of thinking. Okay. All right. And you mentioned and I, I don't wanna um I don't wanna jump around, but I feel like it'll all tie in together, you know, once we get to the middle part of the show. But you mentioned that this specific medium mentioned a name. Yes. And and not you, are, all, sorry. and that's part of what you addressed in Medium Seven, correct? Is that yes. not all mediums? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think names. names. Um, you know, in in the research that I conducted with the ten mediums, names when we do focus groups, focus groups is when you get a number of just 
the general public together, those who have diverse views, and you ask them, you ask them a simple question, what would you need to know? What would you need to hear from a medium to have them um, verify for you or, 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 or justify that life goes on beyond the physical death? What would you need to hear? And names, believe it or not, names of the deceased, names of their loved one, that they're actually there, is it, it rates quite highly. Um, and so it just happened to be coincidental that for me that was actually a big turning point for me because again it's not general right right there's exactly. something like a one in twenty thousand chance that someone could guess um a name which is way beyond probability and so that we use that as an indicator in 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 in, in as um good high level of evidence coming from a medium but do you feel like in your research that that doesn't say you know a medium being able to state names being does not quantify as a, a baseline for all mediums. There's no, absolutely. Other... No, and that's good that you raised that because it's just generally um, to do this kind of research, really there had to be sort of an assessment skill developed first as to what, what levels of evidence um, the mediums would provide during a, a reading um, and then following up with their actual sitters, so the, the individuals that they're reading for. Um, names is just one one type of evidence that rates very highly. Another is uh, the cause of death, the medium being able to name the cause of death. Another one that rates highly in the focus groups and used in our scale relates to a very unique piece of information. And I, I provide some of those kinds of cases that, that, that were brought up. And also intimation, intimation where the sitter, um, sorry, the medium is actually able to intimate very closely the way the deceased smiled or the way they said something. That rates very highly. And again, that information can't be identified from any other sources. And just to clarify, those things that are very low level of evidence are things that are very general, um, to saying things like, um, you know, your mother is with us and she loves, you know, and she loves you. That's what we consider very, it's almost, we could, we score that as no evidence because it's far too general and it's not specific and it's not a demonstration of evidence of survival of consciousness. Okay. Whereas to um, someone that can say, okay, you know, I, I have a picture of um, thinning hair, um, but a big smile, and I interpret that as cancer, but the person was ready to go, so you need to know the person was happy, or is happy now where they're at, more so than where they were when they were sick. That being confirmed is a higher level of validation. Um, just for Sorry, it's hard to hear because I think there's a bit of a breakup um, on the call, I think, a bit. So are, were you saying that they were seeing that the person was smiling? Yeah, I was just giving you a for instance. So it would be a higher, of a higher awareness or a higher rating, as you said, um, of mediumship. If someone could describe a certain person, how they felt about their death, and then confirming um, maybe... Uh, facial characteristics or personality characteristics and combining all those little puzzle pieces yes. would be a and, and perhaps level. I could give you an example of what we would score as high level of evidence. For example, um, in, in a case, in a situation, uh, I, I describe a case in the book about um, how very unique this situation was where the medium was actually able to describe the contents of a picture above um, the the sitter's fireplace. The sitter had lost her husband, and the medium was able to describe that there was a glass that the husband, who was deceased, was holding, and that everyone who walks through the house thinks it's beer, but the but the, the husband, only the husband and the sitter knew that it wasn't beer. It was just a glass of juice. That's what we consider high level of evidence, um, right. because it's so unique and it's so specific um, that there's just no other way that they could know that. So. The, the, the description that you provided, for example, about the smile and that kind of thing would probably be score much lower, and not because it might not be helpful to the sitter. So we want to we separate 
just a general reading versus what we call test mediumship in research, right? Because we're trying, the whole idea of this research is to be able to determine if there is life after death. So we use much more stringent levels of evidence. So it's not to say that when mediums provide any other evidence other than that, it might, it's, could sometimes be very useful for the sitter, but it's not, it's not necessarily scored very highly to be determining um, survival of consciousness. So I just wanted to clarify the distinction there. Right, so as far as your research goes, it wouldn't score very high. That's exactly that's, that's that's right. You're because, thinking, because, yeah, we have so much, we have, to, we have the burden of proof against us, right? Because there's, there's so many rival theories and um, good, good skeptics. I mean, uh, skeptics um, bring up things um, um, that, for example, if we, if we don't have very high levels of evidence, we, we know that there are views that psychics and mediums are not getting information from discarnates, discarnates being um, spiritual entities without a physical body. They could be saying that we're, they're just reading the minds. So if we don't if we don't create um, certain very very high standards, people are just going to say your research is suggesting that people are reading minds. Or do you see what I'm saying, Everly? There has yes, to be you, that. Yes, you have to be, be very high. very careful in how you rate things and and the the steps you take to make sure that everything is done unbiased. Exactly. Exactly. And I think from I. Just the reviews that I read on your book, Medium 7, which I yes. didn't even read until um, a few hours ago because I, I had gone through some other things. I had gone through YouTube and other sources, but um, on Amazon, I believe it was Amazon, that I saw the reviews for your book and, and just raving reviews about how the case studies really represented the scientific aspect of it and how the metaphysical end was tied into it, but it wasn't a biased case study. As right. A whole, which I think is really, really important because I, it's hard to find books, in my opinion anyway, I don't know about the rest of my co-hosts, but um, it's, it's hard to find books that aren't one side more so than the other. Yeah, and absolutely, and it's and it's difficult, right? You've got, I, I mean, I let's put it this way: it's it's difficult to prove to people um, things that they can't see, despite the fact that we, we right now we're living in what we consider the galactic age, um, and the galactic age is an age where, um, for one, it's we, we, we live with wireless. Everything is wireless. We're driven. We're, we're a population that's driven by things that we can't see. People are on their devices every 60 seconds. And you know what I mean, right? Your Blackberry yeah. or your, your, um, your, your computer. And it's driven by um, wireless. Everything is what you can't see. So it's, it's still surprising, though, that people still have difficulty with understanding that although they don't see their loved ones or people that they knew in this physical reality, that they're still there. But I think we do have a lot of um, people are starting to be able to understand um, that we are driven by the unforeseen world, the unseen world. And I think that some of this information um, has to be stringent enough because we're making extraordinary claims. Yeah, and I, I like I like that um, the way that you present that. You know, the world is starting to realize that it's not always, you know, trust with your eyes, not with your heart. Absolutely, and you know what too? I think um, Everly is that people are having a lot of spiritual experiences. So I will still get very skeptics who will write, said, you know, I read your book. I'm I'm now moving into a place where I'm understanding a bit more, but a, B, and C still doesn't make sense to me. Um, but what really gets them is that they've, let's say, had an out-of-body experience, and they're trying to relate their out-of-body experience to what mediums do. And I tell them it's not very different. The fact is is that if you're having an out-of-body experience, um, it's just another verification that your soul is, um, it, you are a spiritual being just living in a physical body in this reality, and you do 
um, you do go to another reality, uh, other dimensions where your soul can continue to create and co-create and um, reach uh, it, the soul, the soul's purpose. And so, people are having so many more personal experiences that they are going to start to really look at look at this more more carefully because we can't we can't um, deny when we have when we have our own. Um, experience. It's harder to just sort of sit there and read research. If you've never had a dream, you've never had a near-death experience, you've never um, had a seen a ghost, or it's very hard. And there, believe it or not, there are people out there that don't even dream. So they they have no spiritual bone in their bodies at all. Um, I yeah, no, I I get that completely, and I think that that's that's what's really important about the work that you do. And kind of closing the gap because over the even I would say over the past two and a half three years the gap between people that were strictly you know um, thought it was all of this stuff was just superstitious and the people that maybe had some belief but weren't really open enough to it and the people that were open to it the gap is closing no, yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. There's just a lot of, especially with the near death experiences. I would say, and I do talk about that in um, in, in 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 my book, simply because I felt that that it, although this book was devoted to a an assessment of ten ten mediums, um, it, I really needed to focus also on the complementary evidence, such as, for example, near death experiences. We're in a time where um, our resuscitation techniques in the medical field are enhanced, and so people, when they're when they do when they are when they're dead, um, there's a greater likelihood of them returning to life because of the resuscitation techniques, and they are able to come back. Big cases like uh, Anita Morjani and even Alexander, who was a, a neurosurgeon, have come back um, with evidence. Um, that their souls continued and they described things uh, that are verifiable while they were physically dead and the medical community knew that they were dead because it was all recorded. So all of that information that we have, um, electric voice phenomena, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, energy healing, all complement um, what mediums have been saying for hundreds of years. Right. So, I mean, now we're, we're in a time where all of the, the two things that were so very separate, spiritual and scientific, are starting to merge. Absolutely. And very good point. I, li I like that point because, unfortunately, they're considered separate. Um, uh, although I would say some great scientists um, did study mediumship uh, right after the, the advent of spiritualism. Um, many great scientists. Um, transformed from their previous work to study this actually later in their career when they didn't care about being ridiculed um, because it's worth it and 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 I didn't get to say at the beginning there's a lot of people want to know why I do this it wasn't just because I think mediums are fascinating and um, that I just wanted to look at that they mediums help us see things we would never have been able to see they provide a door to understanding the true nature of who we are. Where do we come from? What are we doing here and where are we going? They're, they're, in fact, I almost would say that if we didn't have them, other than being able to go to another dimension, which as you know is very difficult um, and very costly to, to send people to another planet, which is impossible, really, um, we don't have any um, insight about the true nature of our reality or other dimensions unless we have people that can actually communicate with people in, in these different dimensions. And on the on on that note, I kind of want to go back to um, the the more skeptical side. Because I do want I do feel like it's important for our audience to know that this was done just like any other um, scientific study would be done. You did not go into this going, oh, I'm going to prove that mediumship is a real thing and this is how it goes, um, that you explored um, I, the negatives 
um, the possibilities of other people believing it that it's evil or fraudulent, that kind of thing. That you did address that in your studies and in your book. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Did you want me to say a bit about that? Yeah, please. Yeah. No, and that's true. Um, and even before I say that, I've had a lot of people, I'm very fair, I remember I was at a book signing and somebody said to me, but, but Donna, truthfully, you must have had some belief for you to go and do three years of three years just of a focus on um, studying 88 cases and 10, uh, 88 clients and 10 mediums and following them up over three years. You must have had some belief because who's going to invest all that kind of time if you didn't believe? And I mean, it's a good point. I reflected on it. I mean, as I said, there were some experiences before that made me think, wow, I, this is worth serious investigation. So I wouldn't say I went into it totally, I'd be lying if I said I was fully objective, but I was objective as an objective person could be, let's put it that way, because I wanted to systematically look at it and lay it out. Um, so some of the things that I discussed in the book, I, I, I felt it, I really needed to, and, and yes, I discussed fraud. So. For example, I'm not saying at all that there weren't aren't mediums, um, and also in the history, when we look at the 20th century and some of the early mediums, um, there there surely, unfortunately, has been, but just not no, it's not any dispropor not disproportionate to any other profession that might have um, some kind of fraudulent behavior. The mm -hmm. the key area that I wanted to discuss was unfortunately the challenge related to religion. I I think that that's our biggest barrier right now. Not to say that theoretically anything's wrong with religion, but unfortunately the traditional religions do not accept mediumship. Yeah, Other than the church, black the or it's white and there's no room for gray. Absolutely. It's just the spiritualist church, which is how mediumship grew out of. Um, the spiritualist church um, having mediums sort of head, you know, Lilydale in New York is the center of spiritualism, for example. Um, and Religion, and even if you, I talk about the witch trials, um, and I talk about the, the Salem witch trial, for example, and really look at that closely, and really look at, you know, I have an a academic background in sociology, and so I, I looked at the social factors that contributed to that hysteria of killing, really, mediums. And when you really look at it closely, the religion mixed in with the, 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 the fear and ignorance um, has unfortunately stayed over generations um, with us. And so even when you have people wanting to see a medium, I've often sat and observed cases where um, the sitter will say, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I shouldn't really do this, I'm Roman Catholic, and they tell me this is evil. So this is this whole background of religion and what mediums are doing and sitters, sitters listening to the medium. Unfortunately, it's sort of integrated in our pop culture that this is evil and it stops people from exploring the natural part of themselves and it, it stops people from learning about the true nature of our reality that we continue uh, beyond our physical life and one of the reasons why I think it was so important to bring out the challenges is yes to let people know that you know there are some problems there's fraud some people expect that mediums are going to give them the answers, but there's a misunderstanding there. Mediums are not responsible for giving answers. They can facilitate information from the deceased or spirit guides or from other higher dimensions, but it's really the responsibility of the person um, to use that information in a, in a, in a very um, objective and responsible way. So I sort of lay out all the challenges that can happen with mediumship, but I still make a conclusion at the end that you have to use me mediums very responsibly um, and that there are limitations with what they can tell you and, and, and that's not just because they're limited, it's because there's many factors that go into what you're going to hear. I and so, agree. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. there's, I, I, I really rely upon the word conduit. Mediums are conduits. That's right. But we don't control the energy or the messages, whatever you want to call it, that go through the conduit. That's and that's just how absolutely, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that, right? That was one key factor. 
we invited skeptics into this research, especially under the controlled situation, the controlled situation where um, I didn't know the media, um, uh, sorry, I didn't know the sitter, and the medium didn't know the sitter. That's what we call a double-blind study. And when the skeptics came in, um, they would they would ask me questions like, well, why, you know, why didn't you um, prepare these questions for the medium to say, okay, what was the name of this person's grandmother? What was the name of... And they don't understand that even if I did that, that doesn't mean that spirit is going to communicate that because spirit decides. The discarnates decide what they're going to share, when they're going to share it, and how they're going to share it. And I think that's what I really tried to do in this um, research was really appeal, well, not a, 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 yeah, appeal to the layman to help them understand a bit more so they wouldn't just sort of close themselves down when they heard, oh, that medium must be a fraud because they can't tell me the name of my grandfather um, right. or can't make my grandfather talk to me. And see, they shut down and without enhancing their awareness on how spirit works or what the limitations are, then they won't go further to explore who they really are. So that was my focus there. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying because it's it's if you're gonna if your mind is gonna be shut out to it and you're going you're gonna go into it and not even be willing to open up, then it's it's just not gonna go well at all, no matter how much you want it to. Yeah, um, and but, and well, um, it, and it's you funny that you mentioned that because this is probably a good time to mention what we call the non-believers experiments. And the non-believers piece was. Um, I would call it a subsection of this study because when I started to analyze the, the results at midway, about a year and a half, I started to notice that, wow, I'm getting all females mostly, and this could be what we call selection bias because these are the sitters that are going to see mediums. Maybe they already believe in mediums. So what I did is I prepared a control of just males who were non-believers, and this was also rec had um, an independent recruiter recruit the sitters just based on those two criteria alone, just that they're males and non-believer, and one, which is on YouTube, people can watch. The other ones were good, too, but I didn't get consent to, to put them on video. Um, oh, what, what's the, what can they look up to get to that video? Yeah, that video is called um, Life After Death, a medium's, uh, oh, geez, it just caught me off guard with the detail on that one. But it's oh, all sorry, of my YouTube videos sure are under Donna Moncrief, not Donna Smith Moncrief, but Donna Moncrief. And that just, it'll pop up. Um, it's And it's, you, you can't miss it because it's it's about, you'll see the male who's being interviewed. Um, and he, it's just what you were saying, Everly, you were saying sort of if they're shut down, um, you know, that creates a negative energy that could prohibit the information. But what was amazing about some of these cases was that it didn't matter that they were negative and they were non-believers because the need was so important. And Chad, which was on this particular video, his friend, he had just lost, we didn't know this until he disclosed it uh, during the experiment, but he had lost uh, a friend just a week to two weeks before and the medium picked up the name, picked up details um, live in a controlled experiment on video about this person, he broke down because he only came for the forty dollars honorarium we were giving him. Had no right. idea that anyone was going to pick up this friend and and the details about his friend um, and how he died and and so forth. So what I would say to that is, although there was negative energy and that there was a non-belief for sure, what transcended the information coming through was spirit felt it was important for this person to know and there was a need because he needed to heal. You could see him break down in the video. In fact, he leaves. You could see him leaving. Um, I have to kind of beg him to come back uh, because he just can't believe. And then there's a post interview with him after he's relaxed for a few minutes and he's able to kind of absorb what just happened. So so what we do know is that even though you have you may have negative energy and you might you know it it's only one factor it doesn't necessarily blow the whole reading no not not at all but if you're it's kind of like what i like to call it is parlor trick if someone says okay i'm here what do you have to tell me and you're yes, going to go yes, okay yes yes that can be off putting for sure <laughs> yeah um but then there's other times when 
it's, you know, people are calling for, okay, um, I, I'm considering applying for a promotion within my company. Can you tell me about that? And then it's just overwhelming that spirit comes in and says something about a past relative. And you just kind of have to go with the flow. But if somebody's completely shut out, they don't want to. They don't want to bend either. Anyway, they just want the question that they asked answered specifically, and it yeah, doesn't work such, that way. Such, yeah, such a, lot a of critical the times it point just you're making. Yeah, such a critical point you're making, and this is again um, why I go into a whole chapter on eight different factors that contribute to an enhanced communication in a reading. Because people would just believe it's just the medium. In other words, in that case that you just brought up, they would say immediately if you couldn't answer it, you're a fraud or you're not a good medium. When in fact, again, I found when people would actually ask questions that were not part of what the medium was getting, much lower levels of evidence, almost a no connection. Because the medium is just getting information that they get. And I found when the sitters were asking questions, there was no connection. Or less, Hello. less, relatively less, I should say, yeah. I am very sorry to interrupt, but we do need to take a one-minute uh, PsychicAccess.com commercial, okay? And we'll be right back in one minute. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com. You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified, and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors, and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com? Okay, and we're back. And Donna, I wanted to, um, I know we're only 40 minutes into the show, but wow, time is flying. Yeah, <laughs> that means we're having fun. <laughs> um, I know there was one thing that just really popped out to me that I really thought was important to get out, and um, it's part of what you go over in Medium Seven is the ten different medium types that you identified. Yes. Can you, you um, just want me to talk? just? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could kind of go over um, the different types and, and just a brief explanation of what each type is so that people that are listening that may think that, that may have abilities can identify with one or the other or multiple or just are looking for a basic understanding of different types of mediums. Okay, sure. So what I'll just say first is just a small preamble to that is that all of the mediums in their interviews um, for their case studies were asked to provide information um, about their backgrounds because I thought it was important for people to understand if there was any kind of physical difference, um, whether they started, you know, when they started, the early years of their psychic development, preparation prior to a reading, description of their extrasensory abilities because all of them, I didn't want to assume that they had all or that they were all clairvoyant, and the explanation of their extrasensory abilities. So, for example, one of the first case studies, uh, Bro Perkins, um, he, one of the, the things that stands out from him that was different and why I made him a full case study is because he does both. So he can connect with uh, the discarnate, but he also has um, the ability to read the blueprint, which is like the Akashic Records. Not uh -huh. all mediums can do that. Um, and just for the audience, in case they're not aware fully of that, it's this, in, 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 in layman's language, it's the book of records. Everything that has happened um, to us as a community, as a society, is recorded in the Kashic records. 
So really how I go through his background and how he would blurt out things and get in trouble in school. And, you know, so you knew that he, as growing up, he had, he had these uh, psychic abilities. Um, but I explain, I try to do my very best to really explain the mechanism, for example, of how he would see the Akashic records. And I describe how he, you know, he's looking through his third eye and reading it like a movie, which explains to the sitter why they can't interrupt him and talk to him because he'll miss pieces of the movie um and so i go into that that type of case study um and also discuss uh the bro's mediumship another type of uh case study that i talk about for example is john papia who is very unique because we call that's like a medical uh intuitive type medium where where he was actually even having difficulty with me with me calling him a medium, um, and I said to him, John, if you're going to be in the book, I, I can't change the title for you because I'm <laughs> title version <laughs> CPM seven. So, but but just to clarify, I mean, it is difficult to put people in little boxes. But the truth is, is what he saw, and his is an amazing case because he he was embarrassed that he could see colors, and he thought everybody else could see colors um, around their heads. Um, and it's quite actually, it's, it's a little bit comical, but the point is, is that he sees the aura and he is able to diagnose. And I, and I, and I interviewed his cases where, where literally were life saving for them. Um, and so through the colors, he's able to diagnose, which is, which is really, um, the form of energy healing. So that's one, another type of medium. Um, and then, uh, Carolyn Mulner. She's in there because she actually exhibits all the types of extrasensory. She uses the clairvoyance, indirect, both indirect and, and direct, um, as well as the clairsentience, which is, which is like the clair, um, which is like clair empathy, but also tastes, um, and which is rare for mediums, can um, get information through taste. Um, and then clear audience. So with this medium, what that signifies for this case is um, how basically, although a medium can have all five of the extrasensory perceptions, um, she still talks about how one is stronger than the other, and the others are almost, she asks spirit to help um, those other ones um, complement um, her stronger one. So that case study brings out the interaction of the different of the different um, extrasensory perceptions, um, right. and then I, I, I go on. I mean, there, there's many many different categories, and then I synthesize at the end some of the key trends. Wow, I just don't I, I don't know what else to say. But wow, um, have you? Um, is there a? I don't know if I miss it, but is there a category or a? You have a out of the 10 is there a physical medium oh good yeah great good question Everly. um in fact at the time of researching and writing this yes um reverend uh goldsby was interviewed he didn't get a full-blown case study but he he was um, an elderly medium who has had a great experience uh, in the church of spiritual church of spiritualism um, including his ancestors, and he started to talk about um, some of the seances and some of the physical mediumship he, he did. But um, one of the things why I didn't discuss physical mediumship in this particular book is because physical mediumship, first of all, the mediums are extremely rare in the world. Um, and their extraordinary claims, right? Physical mediumship being that they can actually, um, as opposed to mental mediumship, is which I'm discussing in the book. Physical mediumship, um, there are claims that they can produce apports, right? Things that materialize from nowhere, um, produce ectoplasm from their body. Um, I mean, no, I'm, I was making a more simple, um, just to clarify, um, a medium that can actually feel the physical pain of someone. Oh, okay, clear empathy. Okay, so that's clear sentience. Yes. Yeah, so many of the mediums, in fact, all of them in the case study, um, a lot of them talked about uh, clear sentience. Um, but specifically, some of them use the, the term clear empathy and clear uh, sentience interchangeably. But Bro specifically talked about an incident, which I think was extremely clear, where he actually felt like he was being strangled before he opened the door. Um, to a sitter and was almost going to call 911, um, couldn't breathe, 
and um, this was he was new to this feeling. Uh, and as soon as the sitter came in, because he, he decided to open the door, and he started to talk about, this brother started to talk about, did you have uh, um, a grandfather, for example, or a brother, I can't remember the relationship, that, that died of strangulation or something like that. It was, it's something to do with this. Um, and as soon as he started to talk about it, the pain went away. And that was absolutely, that was Spirit's way of communicating um, because he did not feel that the medium was going to be able to explain that type of medical problem. So he made him feel it. I got you. I, yeah, I understand that. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to um, jump from what you were talking about because um, yeah. I really am, I think this is going to be interesting to all everyone listening is um, the physical. Oh, no worries. As soon as you said physical medium, I jumped into a whole separate category. But <laughs> so Claire Empathy, just to clarify for the audience, so Claire Empathy, the one that you were looking for, is definitely not, um, we don't categorize that as physical mediumship. Just That's just something that they, um, it's an extra sensory perception that the mental medium uses to communicate with discarnate. Right. But I am extremely interested, and I think everybody else will be, um, to hear about, because I think, doesn't this lead into um, your um, case studies and the research you're doing right now for yes. your next study? Yes. So you mean on the physical medium shift? Yes. 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 I'm, I'm truly excited um, about this aspect of the current research that I'm doing and, and just sort of to slip back into what I was saying about when I was writing Medium 7. Many of the mediums talked a bit around physical mediumship or especially Carolyn, she talked about actually going to a seance where a hand materialized in the seance. And I was so hesitant to write about it because the way I work is through my own experiences and enough triangulated information to make me feel like I can actually say this. I mean, the reason why I make this preamble before I talk about physical mediumship is it's so, we have to be so responsible as researchers in what we are actually sharing because it influences how people think and I would never want to lead people astray. So I didn't talk too much about physical mediumship even though the, the mental mediums referred to some of it. But now um, I've had an opportunity in my second round of research um, to connect with some great people who have, um, we call it the snowball effect. You get, you get uh, recommendations from people. And now I understand that there are about four physical mediums in the world today that actually produce ectoplasm. And just for the audience, I don't want to assume that everybody knows that term, but I always say in my talks, if you saw Ghostbusters, yeah, I was about to say, it. Ghostbusters ectoplasm? Yeah, well, the ghost, in Ghostbusters, that's the first time probably all of us heard the term ectoplasm because it was a slimy green thing that mm -hmm. they were talking about in Ghostbusters. And I believe that, correct me if I'm wrong, was that movie in the 80s? I don't know. Yeah, I think it was. And, and um, the bottom line is there was some truth to that slimy green thing they were talking about because ectoplasm um, is, is, is something that comes out of the physical medium and it's, it's built up from the body, the energy uh, within the, the physical medium and it's produced so that the spirit world can do physical things. That's why it's called, it's called physical medium. can actually either materialize parts of their body, they can actually use their voice through this called direct voice. They can actually produce apports. I feel much more comfortable talking about it now that I'm interviewing these physical mediums and I will actually for the first time be able to sit in on a seance um, with um, one of the top physical mediums in the world to yeah. see this happen uh, myself. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I wish more people could do it. So exciting. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, I. I have heard of, and I don't know if this is a term that you might be familiar with. I mean, everybody uses different terms for different things, but a lot of times I've heard the word controller. If you're going to allow something to physically take control of your physical being, it's important that you have a controller. 
next to you to help regulate things or things can go badly wrong. Absolutely, and and that's a big part of physical mediumship. A lot of the mediums that I'm, uh, the physical mediums that I'm interviewing, have a control team. They call it some call it the spirit team. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, I feel premature in talking about because my evidence is just premature right now, and there's no synthesis yet. And I and as I was sharing, I need to see it first because right now it's more at the oral and theoretical stage for me. Um, but the reason absolutely, why I ask this question is because, and I'll, yeah. I'll this will be my question to you. Yes. I was warned about channeling. Don't channel until you have somebody that you know that you're comfortable so much with that you can trust your life to them. Because if you channel and something takes over and you don't have a controller, things can just go really, really bad to the point of death. And I remember that person telling me that, and okay. uh, I okay. just was wondering if you had come across anything like that in your case studies or in what you're doing right now. Okay, so now that, that, that's very helpful that you provided that context. Um, interesting that you would talk about channeling, because I have to tell you, I didn't come across that with the mediums. However, in the physical mediumship, um, the only the only angle that I can I can share um, um, at this point is to say that in terms of physical mediumship, which some would put channeling, some would put channeling under there. But again, remember that issue about putting things into boxes. Some channelers don't like to be considered physical mediums, right? Um, but absolutely, they will not work without a spirit team because they do go into trance and something does take over their body um, in terms of in terms of being able to speak coming through the ectoplasm and in that particular the reason why the world doesn't know about this too much is because they're very selective about who will go into the seance because if people don't operate properly in the seance and they try to reach out or they move or they're not following the instructions um, it could it could actually kill the medium and that did happen to Helen Duncan when the police raided her um, in the 20th century, um, she was doing materialization and uh-huh. police raided her and um, which, which, which what happened is that created unexpected movement for the spirit team and for the sitters and the energy and it blew the ectoplasm right back into her body um, and she was rushed to the hospital with second degree burns which were seen all over the body and were unexplainable and could have only been the ectoplasm and then she died within three days. So. And that people can look up Helen Duncan. It's it's been it was a tragedy for this physical medium. But to come back to you in terms of the channeling, um, I would take that a bit of that information and um, use it to sort of support at least to say I think that was good advice in terms of making sure that you have the right supports, not only just through the spirit team, but also with the person on the ground who's who's ensuring. Um, that you know, you you are um, your physical body is protected um, from from what you're going through. Right, and I, I don't presume that you agree with me about this, but there's a lot of media out there right now. There's a lot of curiosity. Um, like we said, people are coming into more of an awareness. They're more open to it now. So, but you can't play with it. You have to really pay attention to. Um, people like yourself, people that do the, the case studies and know the ins and outs, what's safe, what's not safe, how to protect yourself. It's not something like tennis. You can't just dabble in it. You can't go into it and be like, oh, well, you know, worst that will happen is I lose the match. And the, it's just that I think that encompasses everything in metaphysical terms. You just really have to know what you're getting into for the safety of yourself and others. Yes, and I like that word that you used, um, something you used the word play, and I caught on to that too because, um, so for example, the Ouija board. People always ask, so Donna, what do you think about the Ouija board? And the whole playing piece um, is is exactly a, a part of what you said is, is very important for the public to understand is that when you work with 
with either mediums or you're going you're using you know you're testing electric voice phenomena which is trying to connect through radio or through um, TV that kind of thing your intent has to be pure the intent has to be for the greater good of the world and that I know my intent is for that p purpose only if you go into it just to play and See if you can connect with demons and you can do or all that. Or be a jerk or spirit, just, you know. Yeah. Spirit will give you that. And and there is this discussion of that in the book, that you play, they're going to play with you. And that's unfortunately why the, the Ouija board has gotten such a bad name, is because people are inexperienced, they're not protecting themselves, they're opening up par portals, and they're, they're actually um, playing. And so spirit comes back and plays. And that playing can become dangerous, unfortunately. And so when people, remember what we were talking about earlier about religion and the negative rap that mediumship had, and that's because it really goes back to your great point that you were making, is that it can't be the intent just to experiment and, and play and, and look for ghosts because you want to have a really exciting thriller night. That's harmful, and we can create demonic experiences for ourselves because we create our own reality. And so yeah. the intent with going to see a medium or going to do physical mediumship, for example, sitting in a seance, cannot be for fun and games. No, it can. And you you can't just, you know, sit there and watch, you know, whatever, whatever type of show might be on, you know, on NBC, ABC, whatever, on hunting ghosts, that type of thing, oh, and just yeah. go, hey, I'm going to get to my friends, and we're going to go to this abandoned farmhouse that I know of, and just yeah. go do this. You cannot do that, because yeah. if I'm you do, sorry. We, we have unfortunately run out of time. Please forgive me for interrupting, but uh, we, we need to wind it down if at all possible. Okay. Um, well, Donna, wow, that was fast. That was Donna? Yes? Okay. Um, last thing that I wanted to um, go over with you is um, your new research is um, near death, out of body, um, and physical mediumship. And um, your website is metaphysicsresearch.com. Is that correct? No, no. It's www.medium7.com. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. And there you can find information on the Medium 7 book, which I think that everybody should read. Um, and also, can they find information as well on what your future ventures are? Because I know you have stuff coming up. Yes. So um, all, some of that is going to be posted on my, on my YouTube channel, which is under the name Donna Moncrief. Some of the upcoming um, research on energy healing also the outcomes of the physical mediumship and some of my work on uh, past life regression and hopefully we'll be updating that website um, very soon. And the name of the book, the full name is uh, Medium 7, Evidence of the Afterlife and Prediction. Okay, all right. All right, and then she's also got a bunch of um, mothers against drunk drivers, just um, what did you call them before? Photo clips? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. There's there's a bunch of um just clips of Donna doing um invest not investigations but studies on YouTube and just pull up just type in her name and it will show you everything and there's just so much that you could watch on her and the work she's done. It's incredible, so yeah, and thank you very much for inviting me, um, Everly. It was a it was a a joy talking to you. Oh, it was wonderful for me to talk to you too, and I hope to hear more from you, you know, as your your next book comes to be and progresses and all that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right, thank you, Donna. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. 
Psychic Access, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. PsychicAccess.com Donna? Hi, how are you? Hi, Donna, I'm good. <clears throat> I was just giving a brief background on you. Um, and um, I was just letting them know that you know, you've got 20 years experience conducting qualitative and quantitative research in the areas of criminology and health. Um, since 2009, you've applied scientific research background to your interest in the survival of consciousness or life after death. Um, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just to broaden that out for our guests that are listening, um, you founded Metaphys Metaphysics Research in 2009 to study mental and physical mediumship and other phenomena to increase awareness about the true nature of reality and your primary intent is to help people understand how they can use spiritual energy to enhance the quality of their lives um, which you know later on in their interview I would like to go to you telling us more about your research and how medium seven your book came to be in the case studies and all of that Sure, happy to do that. Okay. Well, um, let's see. First off, in my interest, I would like to know what what made this transition happen. What brought you from the research aspect over to metaphysical research and really pursuing this to the point of doing case studies and publishing a book and. Okay, well, I guess that's a good question. A good place to start is all at the beginning. And I, I would just say that um, although I'm not a medium myself, I, in the early years, probably starting at the age of 10, that reading was she never had any information about me because it wasn't expected. I didn't make the appointment. I was with a friend, and she said, oh, do you want a reading as well? So I thought, okay. So I think that was, for me, the first time that I realized that there's something more to this. Perhaps there is sort of life after death and then I think that for me was just the sort of the start of that kind of thinking. Okay. All right. And you mentioned and I, I don't wanna um I don't want to jump around but I feel like it'll all tie in together, you know, once we get to the middle part of the show. But you mentioned that this specific medium mentioned a name. Yeah. And, and not you, are, all sorry. and that's part of what you addressed in medium seven, correct? Is that yes, not all think, mediums? Yeah, I think names, names um, you know, in, in the research that I conducted with the 10 mediums, names when we do focus groups, focus groups is when you get a number of just the general public together, those who have diverse views, and you ask them, you ask them a simple question, what would you need to know? What would you need to hear from a medium to have them um, verify for you or, 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 or justify that life goes on beyond the physical death. What would you need to hear? And names, believe it or not, names of the deceased, names of their loved one, that they're actually there, is, it, it rates quite highly. Um, and so it just happened to be coincidental that for me that was actually a big turning point for me because, again, it's not general, right? right There's exactly. something like a 1 in 20,000 chance that someone could guess um, a name, which is way beyond probability, and so that we use that as an indicator, in 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 in, in as um, good high level of evidence coming from a medium. But do you feel like in your research that that and had my own spiritual experiences? So I wouldn't. I, I almost hesitate to say that you know everything just started um, sort of, let's say, ten years ago, because I I'd almost say throughout my whole life I was having spiritual experiences, not not a medium who would do this professionally, but so had sort of that predisposition to sort of wondering what really is the nature of reality, but specifically an incident that happened to me probably um, more into my early university years, probably just in my early 20s. Um, I was visiting a what I thought to be a psychic, because to me at that time I didn't really make a distinguish between psychics and mediums, and it was really only for fun. I was going with a friend, and this medium started telling me um, 
I, I mean, my objective was really just to go there to find out maybe information about my future, you know, what information could they just generally tell me about career and love life, that kind of thing. Very yeah, innocent. Yeah, just, just for fun, just to see what will come about of it. Pardon me? Just to see what would come out of it, really? Exactly. Like just, it was all based on curiosity, exactly. And um, what had happened is she started to tell me that my grandmother was there and what specifically threw me was she stated my grandmother's name, and my grandmother's name is extremely um, specific. It's Beryl, B-E-R-Y-L, and she sort of laughed because she said, oh, I must be getting this wrong because whose name would be Beryl, right, like a rolling barrel? And I explained right. that that's an English name, B-E-R-Y-L. What's interesting about that, Everly, is that um, at that time there was no Internet, and, and not even like my grandmother would have had her name on the internet, but there there really wasn't anything, and I think that was for me like the first ancestry. time. dot com, where you know, she could have figured that out that way. Exactly. There there was no way. There's there was no information. In fact, the, the key part of that doesn't say, you know, a medium being able to state names being does not quantify as a a baseline for all mediums. There's no, absolutely. Other. No, and that's good that you raised that because it's just generally um, to do this kind of research, really there had to be sort of an assessment skill developed first as to what what levels of evidence um, the mediums would provide during a, a reading um, and then following up with their actual sitters, so the, the individuals that they're reading for. Um, names is just one one type of evidence that rates very highly. Another is uh, the cause of death the medium being able to name the cause of death. Another one that rates highly in the focus groups and used in our scale relates to a very unique piece of information. And I, I provide some of those kinds of cases that, that, that were brought up. And also intimation, intimation where the sitter, um, sorry, the medium is actually able to intimate very closely the way the deceased smiled or the way they said something. That rates very highly, and again, that information can't be identified from many other sources. And just to clarify, those things that are very low level of evidence are things that are very general. Um, to saying things like, um, you know, your mother is with us, and she loves, you know, and she loves you. That's what we consider very. It's almost we could we score that as no evidence because. It's far too general, and it's not specific, and it's not a demonstration of evidence of survival of consciousness. Okay. Whereas to um, someone that can say, okay, you know, I, I have a picture of um, thinning hair, um, but a big smile, and I interpret that as cancer, but the person was ready to go, so you need to know the person was happy or is happy now where they're at, more so than where they were when they were sick. That being confirmed is a higher level of validation. Um, just for, sorry, it's hard to hear because I think there's a bit of a breakup um, on the call, I think, a bit. So are, were you saying that they were seeing that the person was smiling? Yeah, I was just giving you a for instance. So it would be a higher, of a higher awareness or a higher rating, as you said, um, of mediumship. If someone could describe a certain person, how they felt about their death, and then confirming um, maybe uh, facial characteristics or personality characteristics and combining all those little puzzle pieces. Yes, and, and perhaps level. I could give you an example of what we would score as high level of evidence. For example, um, in, in a case, in a situation, uh, I, I describe a case in the book about um, how very unique this situation was, where the medium was actually able to describe the contents of a picture above um, the, the sitter's fireplace. The sitter had lost her husband, and the medium was able to describe that there was a glass that the husband who was deceased was holding and that everyone who walks through the house thinks it's beer. But the, but the, the husband, only the husband and the sitter knew that it wasn't beer, it was just a glass of juice. That's what we consider high level of evidence. Um, right. Because it's so unique and it's so specific, 
um, that there's just no other way that they could know that. So the, the, the description that you provided, for example, about the smile and that 